It's no secret that healing this season is absolutely brutal. Certain keys, especially on Tyrannical, can send shivers down the spine of even the most accomplished healers. Well, fear not, as we hit up Echo Raider and Mythic Plus healer extraordinaire Thaner and asked him to share his secrets. When someone mutters the words Uldaman, as a healer, you immediately think of one thing and one thing only. Sentinel Talandros. Stepping up to this guy on tyrannical weeks almost guarantees to put hairs in the chest of any healer, even after the recent nerfs. To start, let's break down all you need to know as a healer. The two main mechanics here to be aware of are Crushing Stomp and Earthen Shards. Earthen Shards is an instant ability that will target a random non-tank player, inflicting very high initial damage, in addition to causing the target to take heavy bleed damage every 2 seconds for 10 seconds. Crushing Stomp is an AoE damaging ability that will deal very high damage in addition to knocking all players back. It's also important to note that due to unrelenting, the boss will be ramping up in damage as the fight progresses. When engaging the boss, the first mechanic will always be an earthen shard. How you choose to handle this one is up to you, as it's common practice to lust on pull on this boss. On lower level keys, most healers tend to just utilize the increased haste to heal through it with some standard spot healing. Where on higher level keys, you may want to look to have that player use their dwarf racial if they have it, or any personal they have access to. Otherwise, give them an external. Part of what makes this boss so healing intensive is that after that shard goes out, you have only a few seconds until we see the first stomp cast. The first and most important concept here, as well as for the rest of the fight, is to always make sure that the player with the spike debuff is at full health going into the stomp cast. As we always know, the first cycle is going to happen in this exact order. Healers with ramps can start immediately preparing for group-wide damage, so this would be a great time for Disc Priests to pop Rapture, Druids to pre cast wild growth and get hots ready, and evokers to either have some echoes prepared or a rank 1 dream breath already rolling. Once the stomp damage goes out, we see the second key concept of the fight, and that's making sure to immediately have some way to top the group straight after the stomp damage. Why we need to top the group immediately is because after the first stomp in a cycle, we will always get another earthen shard right after, dealing very high initial damage and likely killing anybody who were unable to heal to full health. This second earthen shard is exactly the same priority as the first, meaning we have only around 5 seconds before the next lot of AoE damage from the second stomp goes out. This is another pressure point. This would be a good time to remove the shard bleed if possible, give them an external, or have them use a personal, in addition to focusing heavy spot healing into that player to ensure their full health for the stomp cast. After the second stomp has occurred, you have some breathing room, and there is no immediate requirement to top the group. This is because the boss should now be at 100% energy, causing her to cast Titanic Empowerment and subsequently get stunned. This gives you around 15 seconds before the next mechanic and marks the end of the first cycle. Once out of the stun, as we mentioned earlier, the boss will then gain Unrelenting, dealing 5% more damage for the rest of the fight and starting a new cycle. To quickly explain what we mean by cycle, on pull, the boss will always follow the same order of Earthen Shard, Crushing Stomp, Earthen Shard, Crushing Stomp, Stun. After each stun ends, the cycle will change to always start with a stomp, following the order of Crushing Stomp, Earthen Shard, Crushing Stomp, Stun. There is, however, a chance to sometimes get an additional Earthen Shard between stomps, but it's rather unlikely if you're doing the boss correctly. The key takeaway here is that for all future cycles, the point of pressure for you as a healer is always going to be that first stomp whenever the boss recovers from a stun. The reason for this is that Earth and Spike will then always follow moments after, immediately killing anybody who isn't at full health, especially as damage starts ramping up more and more. So it's always at this point where you're going to want to have major group healing cooldowns ready. Things like Revival, Shaylun's Gift, or just Vivify Cleave for Monks. Emperor Anomaly, Spirit Bloom, Dream Breath, Rewind, or Communion Ramp for Evoker. Barrier, Rapture, or an Instant Radiance proc for Disc. Him, Apotheosis, and your Holy Words for Holy Priest. Beacon of Virtue, Wings, Divine Toll, or Holy Prism for Paladins. Flourish, Trank, Convoke, as well as Prehots for a Druid, and either Link, Healing Tide, Ancestral Guidance, Ascendance, Primordial Wave, or a Cloudburst setup for Restoration Shamans. The average length of this fight can range anywhere between around 2 minutes on a 20, up to slightly over 3 minutes on a 25, so keep note of that for cooldown usage, with each of these high priority stomps happening around every 30 seconds. Once the first and highest priority stomp has been healed up quickly, exactly like the first cycle, your primary objective then turns to ensuring the survival of the player that received Earthen Shard throughout the bleed damage, as well as making sure they're at full health going to the second stomp. So this is where rotating personals, externals, racials, or any spot healing cooldowns come into play. 
Remember though, once the second stomp in a cycle has gone through, there should never be any immediate rush to heal up the group as you'll have some slight downtime before the next. Then from there, you just rinse and repeat until the boss dies. For some quick tips on this fight, any way to remove physical bleeds are obviously exceptionally strong here. Things like Cauterizing Flame, Dwarf Racial, Blessing of Protection, and Immunities should be saved for points where the player is low going into the stomp or to preserve other cooldowns. Evokers on pull can pop stasis, hit Cauterizing Flame on yourself and the two highest priority DPS in your group, then once the first shard goes out, immediately dispel it with Cauterizing Flame. This will then enable you to use stasis to remove the next shard application, in addition to resetting the cooldown on your Cauterizing Flame, making the first three shard casts easy to handle. The stomp itself is physical AoE damage, so it can be reduced by abilities like Zephyr and Faint, as well as dodged with Evasion. Restoration Druids are also able to use Tranquility combined with Inner Peace to immune the knockback. Lastly, Ward of the Faceless Ire should be considered if you're lacking ways to deal with the shard damage, as this can entirely negate one application. Our next boss is a little different, almost entirely relying on your ability to dish out unlimited amounts of healing per second to survive. Kajin the Unyielding. Again, let's break down everything you need to know on this fight. Kajin has a few important mechanics. Glacial Surge, which summons icy rings that surge out from her, creating ice boulders, just move slightly away to avoid the first set, and then walk back in to avoid the second. Hailstorm, which will one-shot anybody hit by the cast, simply hide behind an ice boulder to survive. Frost Cyclone, making the boss pick a random party member, dealing high damage to anybody hit, as well as breaking ice boulders. And then Frost Shock, which will do some initial damage to the tank, as well as reducing his movement speed. This can be dispelled, but in most cases, doesn't have to be. What makes this boss healing intensive, though, is Polar Winds. This inflicts very high ticking damage every 1.5 seconds throughout the entire encounter. Before you pull, in order to give yourself the best chance of surviving, there are a few tips. First, identify who you believe to be high priority healing targets. So that's classes and specs that have limited self-healing and survivability against consistent damage. Shamans or hunters are great examples of classes that will need extra healing here, whereas warlocks and shadow priests will be slightly more durable, making them less of a priority. This is important for druid especially, as these are the ones you're then going to want to keep life bloom active on. Us as healers, as well as tanks, will generally need far less healing on this fight due to passive leech and overall self-healing being far higher than that of DPS. After that, you'll then want to do as much preparation as you can going into the fight. Getting up pre-hots like rejuvenations, renew, renewing mist, reversions, shields, you name it. Anything you can do to min-max is going to be beneficial on a fight like this. Then drink and make sure you're full mana. Now that you've pulled, the first important concept is positioning. You want to make sure your entire group is stacked on the boss at all times. This will not only limit movement, but more importantly, make healing far more potent for practically every healer. As it's common practice to always use Bloodlust here, a great tip is that you'll want to rely on this for the bulk of your healing at the start of the fight. So just either letting your hots do the work or spamming casted heals, however your spec plays, holding on to important cooldowns for later into the fight. Also, it's key to note that unless a player gets hit by something they shouldn't, there will be no random damage spikes on this fight at all, meaning the damage intake will be, for the most part, completely consistent throughout the fight. Depending on key level, the fight will be over in about 2-3 to three minutes. This means you'll be able to get multiple uses out of shorter cooldown abilities like Stasis, Convoke, Avenging Wrath, and Rapture during the fight if used fairly early. That way you can then rely on longer one-use cooldowns like Communion, Rewind, Ascendance, and Healing Tide to bridge the gap between. For instance, watching J.B on a 25 Tyrannical. We see him hold off on any cooldowns for the first 15 seconds of the fight, relying solely on his sustained HPS combined with Lust, then once health bars get low, he uses Convoke to recover. Goes back into his sustained AoE healing rotation to keep the party at a reasonably safe amount of health for another 30 seconds until he's required to use his Flourish and Nature's Vigil combo to recover again. This, then combined with his sustained output, bridges the gap until Convoke comes back up for a second time at 1 minute and 17 seconds into the fight. 20 seconds later, once players dip low again, he commits his Tranquility, further bridging the gap until his third Convoke is back. Finally, at which point he can use the second use of both Flourish and Nature's Vigil as a recovery tool to ensure the boss goes down. While this healing rotation is specific to Druids, a similar principle can be observed by analyzing cooldown usage across logs from similar level tyrannical keys. The key concept remains consistent, prioritize maximizing sustained AoE healing to minimize the rate at which health bars decrease. Once that isn't enough, use a cooldown to recover slightly. 
Repeat this until the boss is defeated. Keep in mind, it's a high damage fight. Health bars will naturally drop low and that's expected. So as long as you're continuously rotating and aiming to get the maximum value out of every use of your cooldowns, you will be just fine. For some additional tips on this fight, prioritize healing. In contrast to previous seasons where healers focused on damage output, this boss encounter and this dungeon as a whole requires a strong emphasis on healing, making healing your top priority above all else. Damage is not a concern here. Priest healers should consider picking up Angel's Mercy. This can be advantageous for this fight. The consistent damage intake allows you to have almost permanent uptime on your desperate prayer, providing continuous self-healing and increasing your survivability. Lastly, coordinate positional ground effect abilities. When using positional ground effect abilities that require your team to gather inside, such as Power Word Barrier or Spirit Link Totem, be mindful of the boss's mechanics. Always check the timers and ensure that no glacial surge or hailstorm is incoming, as additional movement can diminish the effectiveness of your cooldowns. Neltheris is a dungeon so brutal that it's basically hell on earth for healers, and a large reason for that is our next boss. Despite even recently being nerfed, it still poses one of the most brutal healing checks this season has to offer. We're of course talking about Forge Master Gorek. There are two main abilities you're going to have to be aware of here, Might of the Forge and Blazing Aegis. Might of the Forge is the main one, and will cause the boss to jump to the anvil located in the center of the room, doing immediate damage to the entire group followed up by then hitting the anvil three times after the same amount of group-wide damage. Our next mechanic, Blazing Aegis, happens immediately after, causing the boss to throw his shield at a non-tank target, dealing high initial damage and applying a dot for four seconds. This will then bounce to two other marked targets immediately after. When you engage Gorik, it's key to note that he will always immediately go straight into his Might of the Forge ability. This makes any preparation you can do prior to pulling a huge benefit, so similar to Kajin. Druids will want to get pre-hots, evokers can get some pre-reversions running, priests can get some shields and renews up, monks can spread renewing, and shamans can even get some riptides, just any pre-buffer you can get. We're also again always going to want to bloodlust this boss, which we'll want to use together with our preparation to cover the damage of the first Might of the Forge. One good tip is to pay attention to how much damage that first tick of Might of the Forge does to the group as this will then allow you to gauge how much the three ticks after will be doing. Straight after Might of the Forge, the boss will then begin casting Blazing Aegis on a player. You'll be able to identify which of the three players are being hit by the debuff on your party frames. This does very high initial damage, so your priority is to always make sure everybody, but especially the three debuff players, are full health after the last hit. After the initial damage of the Aegis, there will then be four ticks of very high damage over time from the debuff left behind. At the same time as the Aegis goes off, you'll also see some swirlies come from each of the three targets. These will then explode, so make sure you're moving out of these. As long as you have enough healing to sustain the three players through the Aegis damage over time, you'll now have a small buffer of around 13 seconds until the next Might of the Forge, which happens every 30 seconds. Meaning there's no need to panic heal up your group here, but you'll of course want to make sure you get everybody full health and get out any pre-healing for the next Might of the Forge. On average, assuming it's tyrannical, the kill timings will be around 2 minutes on a 20 and 3 minutes on a 25. So we're going to want to space our cooldowns out in order to survive either 4 or 6 of these Might of the Forge into Blazing Aegis combos. As the damage comes every 30 seconds, it's relatively manageable. For example, Evokers can look to prepare some Echoes as he jumps to the Anvil with Temporal Anomaly, then begin channeling Dream Breath to max rank the moment the boss hits the Anvil healing up your group to full right before the third strike goes off. Then for the Aegis damage, you can begin precasting Spirit Bloom to heal the three targets after they get hit. Paladins can save Virtue for every time the boss jumps to the anvil. This will then last throughout the whole Might of the Forge, using Holy Prism to heal through the initial damage of the Aegis. Discs can look to time or radiance to land the moment the boss jumps to the anvil, then use Schism and Shadow Covenant to heal through the damage, saving the second charge of radiance when needed. Lust should be enough to cover the first two sets. Rapture can be used to cover the third. And then for the fourth, you can place a barrier just as the boss is about to jump to the anvil. This, if placed as late as possible, will last up until the initial damage of the Aegis. Shamans can prepare Riptides on the full group combined with Primordial Wave, drop a Cloud Burst as the boss jumps to the anvil, and use Chain Heal to cover the damage from the first hit. Then cast a Healing Wave to cover the damage between the second and third hits. Cloud Burst will last the whole duration, so it can be popped when needed. Combined with Bloodlust, this should cover the first two sets. You can then use Ascendance for the third, Link for the fourth. Mistweaver Monks, on the other hand, should have Shaylun's Gift for every set, which coupled with Vivify Cleave is enough to cover each set. Cocoon and Chi-Gi can be rotated in once Lust runs out. 
whereas druids can look to rotate either flourish, vigil, and convoke to cover each set. Above all else though, as a whole, regardless of spec, you always want to primarily focus on healing and using cooldowns to survive through the might of the forge damage, all with the goal of making sure players are top prior to the Blazing Aegis debuff going out. Blazing Aegis can then just be covered with some additional spot healing. Just remember, as long as your group doesn't die to the ticking damage, you have ample time to recover until the next Might of the Forge, as there should be no additional damage going out. For some additional tips, when the boss selects the initial target of Blazing Aegis, if you're able to use any ability to drop combat, you can skip the mechanic entirely, so that's things like Vanish, Feign Death, or Shadow Melt. Last of all, due to the anvil and the raised platform, you can often have line of sight issues here, so make sure you have all of your groups stacked up on one side, and if possible, as a healer, you should stand on the raised platform. Alright then guys, that was three of the most brutal Mythic Plus healing checks this season made easy. Now, we want to hear from you guys. What bosses or even trash packs would you like to see featured next? Let us know in the comments below. But if you enjoyed the video and would like to see more content in the future, don't forget to give this video a like and hit that subscribe button. As always, thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.